How is everyone? Okay, well, this broke. Are we ready to begin? Okay, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. I missed you guys last week. I really did. Um, I'm glad I got to be back with you. Uh, we are three weeks into our new series, and hopefully you've been enjoying this series, and it's based on a book called The Philokalia. Do you guys remember what the Philokalia means? Philo means love. Kalia means beauty. So this book is the Bible of Orthodox spirituality, and it's called The Love of the Beautiful One. I think it's a great introduction to Orthodox spirituality. I have been wanting to do this series for a number of years, and we're finally getting to do it. And I think the book that we're reading, which is this one, this is not the Philokalia. This is someone who's taken some pearls from it. It's actually five volumes, and only three of the volumes are in English. So if you start to read this, you might begin to get a taste of the goal and the way towards union with Christ. And I think it's important for us to know the goal and especially the way. Now, I think what's nice about the title, and we had this discussion in our small group, the title, The Love of the Beautiful One, tells you that our spirituality is a matter of, it's a matter of the heart. <clears throat> Oftentimes we, we forget that our union to Christ is more with our heart than with our body. But it is both. But our heart is the temple of all that we are. His spirit dwells in us, in our temple. And that's what unites us to Christ. And again, we are united physically to him. That's why we take the communion. But we're also united spiritually and I think sometimes what happens is we get distracted and we focus on the physical aspect and we think that our spirituality is based on the physical. Actually, the physical part of our spirituality is crucial. It's extremely necessary, but that is not the goal. And I think for some people, we forget that the goal is not the body. Controlling the body is a means to the goal. And the goal is uniting the heart with Christ. And so we have to understand if the message that you are receiving from the church and the fathers and everything is physical, then you've missed it completely. The philokalia and the orthodox spirituality, it's all about the heart being united with Christ because the heart is the center of who we are. I'm going to talk a little bit about the book in a second. How many of you have had to invest for retirement? How many of you have had a 401k and you actually got to choose what you invest in? For how many of you that was a disaster? I want to ask you, if you had to ask one person, if you could have a conversation with one person about investing in the stock market, who would it be? Not George. Okay, good. And, and not me. George may have some experience, but if you could have one conversation investing in the stock market, who would it be? There's one name I want to hear. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is the third richest man in the world. He's only, he's only down the second guy by $200 million. He only has $73.1 billion. $73.1 billion, and he got it from the stock market. So if you're going to ask someone about the stock market, I could ask George. Or I could ask Warren Buffett. If I wanted to, now there might be very few conversations I would have with Donald Trump. Very few. But one of them would be real estate. He knows something about real estate because he is way up here when it comes to real estate. Politics I wouldn't ask him about yet. Um, but you see how when you want to know something well, you go to the people who are at the top. This book, it's written by people who are at the top. People who have reached the highest level of spirituality. And I would want to ask them, how did you get there? I may not ever reach there. 
But I want to know what was it that got you there? So I want you to listen now. Look at some of the chapter titles in this. I just grabbed a few. I want to know if any of you have ever read a chapter on spiritual perfection. I mean, that's not written by George not or me. That's written by like spiritual perfection, union with God, spiritual knowledge. Remember how we did a series on love, right? Love and the perfection of living, 100 texts. A treasury of divine knowledge. The next one, 400 texts on love. These are people who have reached the highest level. There's prayer, silence, virtues, and so many more. Like, this is incredible stuff. Look at this last chapter. This was written by St. Simeon, the new theologian. He is, like, way up there. His chapter is called, A Discourse on Faith and Teaching for Those Who Say That It Is Not Possible for Those Who Find Themselves in the Worries of the World, Like Us, to Reach the Perfection of Virtues. A narration that is beneficial at the beginning. There's a whole chapter on saying, you believe you who are living in the world can't be perfect. This chapter is for you. This is like the Bible of Orthodox spirituality. They're showing us the road. It's how to become a holy person. And for those who want to get there, and I'll tell you what, it's not based on theories. It's based on Practical experience. And that's what you want. So many saints in the church have become saints by following what's in the book. People have gotten there by the teachings that are already here. So you want to know, how do you get to be a saint? We've already excluded me and George. But if you went here, it's a proven path. Now, one thing that many of the authors state, they say that this book is not entirely for monastic people. And they emphasize over and over that much of this is for lay people. Because the call to prayer, the call to stillness, the call to silence, the call to theosis and union with God is actually for every Christian. For every Christian. So those of you who think it can't be for you, it is. Now, many of us realize that we may never get there. George might. I don't think I will. But you know what? They didn't start there. They didn't start there. They started somewhere that got them there. And so they have that experience. And I wanted to tell you, do you want to know how much Warren Buffett started off with? He was 20 years old. He had $9,800. By the age of 32, he had 250 million. I wish I had listened to him when I was starting off at the age of 20. I would have been a zillionaire by now. But a lot of time we look and say, man, they're so high up here. But they all started somewhere. Probably where we are and sometimes even way further. So I don't want you to be discouraged by the fact that they're amazing people. They weren't born that way, but they struggled. They found the path, and this book talks to us about the path. So then you have the option. You can ask me or George about stocks. And George and I, I've I've made at least $1,000. I won't tell you how much I've lost, but I've made some. Or you can ask someone who's, who's lost a lot and made so much and said, I would really want to know, despite your losses, how is it that you have so many victories in this spiritual life? I say, listen, it's all right here. It's all right here. It's important to study the lives of those who have proven that they can achieve. So now, one of the purposes of the Philokalia, so it's not like one of the writers actually gathered it. Someone centuries later gathered the book. He says, these are amazing. Everyone should have access to these. He says, the reason we have this book, the reason why I gathered together, says, you have received the perfecting seeds of grace through baptism. 
When you were baptized, you received the seeds that allow you to become perfect like Christ. You already have that in you. But the flame needs to be fanned. So he talks about a fire and he says, what this book does is it removes the ashes. Which it says, it talks about removing the passions, which is critical for us to grow. Then it talks about replacing the ashes with more wood, which is obedience to the commandments and the Jesus prayer. And then it says, you flame them, you blow upon the sparks with repentance and more of the Jesus prayer. And then, this is the part I wanted to quote, it strikes up within you a strange and wondrous fire. The fire burns away the passions and sweetens the whole inner person and enlightens the mind. Many of us are saying, my relationship with Christ isn't quite sweet yet. Oftentimes it's bitter, it's struggle, it's sweat, and I don't know that I even want to go there. Then the people who have gotten there said, you know what? You'll have this fire where Christ is sweet. Again, Warren Buffett could tell you to invest in the stock market and say, I don't know. But if he tells you, you might say, you know what? It's worth a shot to go there. And then he says, I'm inviting you to read the book so that you could find the kingdom of God in your hearts. You could find the kingdom of God in your hearts. He talks about the treasure in the field where Christ says there's a treasure in the field and someone goes and sells all that they have that they could find it and that they could obtain it. He says the treasure is actually already in you. He says, and this is the sweet Christ. And they keep talking about Christ as sweet. I don't know if you can describe him in such a nice way, like sweet Christ. I don't. I want to know him as my sweet Christ. And then he says this, you will be freed. Like what is the benefit? You will be freed. Freed from what? Freed from your anxieties? Freed from your lusts? Freed from your passions? Freed from your weaknesses? You will be freed from all that chains you down? He says that's part of the sweet Christ. He says not only will you be free, but then you will be purified. You will be full of goodness. Like the sweet Christ who is merciful, where kindness flows in abundance, where charity is to the point of giving oneself, where there's love, there's no bounds, where there's mercy that doesn't hold back. That's the kind of purity that you could have. You could be freed. Think of all the emptiness and anxiety and all the selfishness that you want to get rid of and all the purity that you want to obtain. Why would you not want to go further? Heaven will seem to you not based on words, but based on your experience. There will be a holy desire that will burn inside of you, that you will want heaven. You will want the kingdom of God, and you will want the one who resides there and is in charge. You will want to love Christ more and more and be in him and connected to the him. And I don't want you to all to leave here and go to the desert. I'll have no one to speak to. But that desire to be with Christ will surpass all other desires. But then you say, well, we may not want this. We, I don't know if I want to go there. And I'll tell you why. And it occurred to me. It's because of our passions that we don't want to go there. Because of what we're already holding on to that we like so much. Because we like our certain things we know that are unholy, and we want to hold on to those more than Christ. There's a verse in the Bible that says, To the pure, all things are, are pure. To the pure one, they could see the beauty of that. But I may not see it from where I am because my heart isn't pure. I just don't understand how good it is. So I can't make the judgment on my own. My view is clouded. So don't trust yourself at this point. Trust the people looking back. You know, I was thinking about this. How many of you have had to try to teach kids to swim? 
it's painful. It's painful, right? The youngest one sees all the other kids. They're jumping and diving and like they go to the beach and there's waves and the little one sits on the shore. And then after you're in a pool, like they sit on the step and everyone else is having fun and they want to, but like, I'm afraid. When they go in and they actually make it, they could say, I'm okay on the step. The water is good. And they sit there and they play. But then they get to experience a wave. And they're like, wow, I never knew what a wave was like. How much of a thrill it is to ride that wave. I would have never known had I gone, not gone myself. We can tell you whatever, but if you never go yourself, you'll never know what it's like to ride the wave. When they talk about the sweetness of Christ or the flame burning inside of you, that's not something you can just read about. Read about. you got to be it. you got to live it. You have to want it. It has to be you. Now, we have no idea what slides will show up, so hopefully they will be somewhat in order. St. Isaac the Syrian. I was attending a seminar, and the patriarch of the Antiochian Orthodox Church was talking about St. Isaac the Syrian. So he gave this warning. He says, if you're going to read St. Isaac the Syrian, he says, do not read more than one page a day. Now, he wasn't talking to the high school youth meeting. He was talking to seminarians and clergy and monks, he says, and other bishops. He says, don't read more than one page a day because this is the most you're ever going to get and you want to absorb it. So I'm going to give you a paragraph. You'll be good. You can read the rest of the page when you go home. But this, he says, enter eagerly into the treasure house that lies within you. And so you will see the treasure house of heaven. The two are the same. So the treasure in you, the treasure house of heaven, he says the two are the same, and there is but one entry into them both. The ladder that leads to the kingdom of heaven is within you and is found in your soul. Dive into yourself and in your soul, and you will discover the rungs by which to ascend. There are two journeys that we talk about in the spiritual life. There is the external journey and the internal journey. And most of us focus on the external journey. And that's obedience to the commandments. We focus on behavior modification. If I want to, you know, grow, i got to change this and this and this and this. But I was just reading this book, Themes from the Philokalia. It's Watchfulness and Prayer. It's a great book. They says that's the secondary journey. But the more important journey is the inward journey. It's the one where the heart unleashes, is opened, and you discover inside of it the treasure. Like I said, the treasure that is in you is the same treasure in heaven, and it's the same entry path. When you go to counseling, when you go to counseling, what are they asking you? You want to know what they're trying to find out? They're trying to find out what's in your heart, because that's where all the problems and solutions lie. It may not be the act of adultery. That's the problem. It could have been what was way before that. What was the actual initiation? What is the initial need that wasn't satisfied or dealt with? Your gambling problem, it's not the gambling itself, but there's a need or a desire or something that you're craving, and that's the issue. Oftentimes, all of our spirituality, we focus on what do I need to change? And the fathers tell us, Dive into your heart. And it says, if you could acquire more knowledge of yourself and knowledge of God, you will then begin to grow. The more you know yourself, and how many of us could agree? Yeah, you know, I had this problem. I didn't know what the underlying issue was. That I had this anger in my heart or had an experience as a child and now I'm anxious. I didn't know what the issue was until my heart and now I've addressed it and now I've moved on. How many of us are saying, you know the passions and the problems and the issues of your heart? So I got to tell you, How do we begin this inner journey? And it's really good to hold the remote, but go and press the button there. Um, How do you begin the inner journey? St. Theophan the Recluse is an awesome 
writer, if you ever want to read something spiritual, he says this. We will achieve nothing by our own efforts. Like, man, why am I doing this? Yet, God will not give us anything unless we work with all our strength. Does it make sense to you? You have to make an investment, as Peter talked about. You have to put something into it if you want to get something out of it. But you will not get there. Like, you can't earn God's grace. As hard as you try, it's God the God is the one who gives you His grace in order for you to grow. You will not grow at all in your spiritual life without the grace of God. And so what should we be seeking? The grace of God. And the grace is not just mercy. Grace is His power, His gifts in you. And the fathers say you will receive grace not based on your struggle, but based on your humility. And humility and prayer and the sacraments. They say, focus on humility, prayer, and the sacraments. You will receive that grace. Okay. I'm going to finally get to the topic soon. What is the goal of our spiritual life? It's not just salvation. The goal of our Christian spiritual life, it's not to be saved. It's to be united with God and to become like Him. That's the concept of theosis. We did a whole series on that a couple of years ago. Theosis, to become like God. Now, we may not complete, we will not complete that process here on earth. It'll be completed in heaven. You will be perfected in heaven. But that's the goal. To be holy as our Father in heaven is holy. Do you understand that? If you're a Christian, your goal has to be to want to be holy like your Father in heaven. Is that your desire? Is that your plan? You know, you ever have, okay, resolution 2017, um, become holy. Who wants to become holy? By the, you have a five-year plan, a ten-year plan to become holy? We have career goals. We have plans for our children. But who wants to be holy? As a Christian, that's your calling, to be holy, to be like Christ. Now, i got to tell you, every time you make a movement on the path of holiness, which is a journey, it's a long journey, every time you make a movement forward, there is a great resistance to pull you backwards. Is that correct? During Lent, how many of you are saying, I am going to read more and I am going to pray more but this is the busiest season at work of the whole year for some reason how many of you say I was fasting but you know what I'm giving up on it because I have these thoughts that I'm not benefiting so I'm going to give up because of those thoughts or how many of you had a perfect liturgy today you know what I mean by a perfect liturgy you walked in, you closed your eyes, there was no one here, just the angels, you and Jesus Christ, and there was no, you were not thinking about the person that walked in late and stood in front of you. You're like, oh man, you're not thinking about the kid that won't be quiet. You're not thinking about what you're going to do after. You're not thinking about the coffee. You're not thinking about how long Mark is going to take until you get your coffee. Where you were in it, you were with Christ praying. How many, everyone just raise your hand, that was, that was today? See, every time you wanted to make a step forward, there's lots of attempts to take you backwards. So I just want you to know, when you go home, you try and pray, what happens? You say, I'm going to spend this night in prayer. The whole night. You go in, and you can't think for one minute about Jesus Christ. Your mind is flooded with thoughts about the kids and about things tomorrow and things you have to do for tonight and then things that happened yesterday and all these. And you're like, I can't spend five minutes. And your goal was to do what? Whole night with me and Jesus Christ. I'll be honest, you're not alone. Every single Christian including the writers who have re risen to the top, they've all experienced the same thing. It's okay. 
and they tell us there's something that you need. We know the answer. The answer is watchfulness. Watchfulness. In a lot of the books that you might read, they call it nepsis. It's being awake and being vigilant. So where did the fathers come up with this as the solution? Where did they come up with this idea of watchfulness? You know what? I will tell you the fathers are the most biblically centered people in the history of the planet. They got it from the Bible. And it's all over the Bible, this concept of watchfulness. So back in the Old Testament, there's this great verse. It says, keep your heart with all diligence. Oh, there's another verse. Oh, right below it. Right, let me start with the second one. Beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart. He's saying, be careful and look at your heart, lest there be a wicked thought. He says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. He says, pay attention and be watchful to your heart, because everything in your life stems from your heart. Then Christ said it over and over, take heed, watch, and pray. You do not know when the time is. He's talking about his second coming. Another time, he's talking about the second coming. He says, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down. He says, pay attention to yourself. You don't want your heart to be weighed down. With what? Carousing. Anyone carouse? To Alaska? No. Carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life. That seems like me. The cares of this life, he says, take heed to yourselves and don't be weighed down with the cares of this life because on that day it might come on you unexpectedly. So he says, watch, therefore, and pray always. Watch and pray always. He says, you have to pay attention every moment. And the theme of this book is, it's not watchfulness, it's watchfulness and prayer. They go together. So these are from Christ. He says, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. You want to escape the final thing? He says, watch and pray. In the last week before he leaves, he's getting messages. You know the parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins, right? How many of them were virgins? All ten, right? They all did something great. They all had lamps. But they all slept. And then the five wise ones had oil. The five foolish ones did not have enough when they woke up because they were not vigilant and aware. So what happens? The bridegroom comes and the ones with the lamps burning enter in. And the ones who didn't have enough lamp, oil in their lamps, what happened? They're out because they were not vigilant and watching. They didn't have enough. And so what does it say at the end? It says... Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Before Christ left, he said over and over, Watch, watch, watch. And then there's this one time where he says it, where I think it resonates with a lot of us. You know what happens in the garden, right? It's his most passionate night. He's praying and it says he, his heart was so sorrowful. He is praying and he's sweating tears of blood. Right? Like there's drops of blood. That's his sweat. Like this is a difficult night. You would think the three apostles that he said, come with me. Like, okay, we're going to be there for you. And what happens? He says he came to the disciples. He found them sleeping. He said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one Hour. He says, couldn't you watch? What I wanted you was to watch. He says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He said, you should have watched because you could fall into temptation. Well, what happened to Peter that night? What was his temptation? He denied Christ. He was not watching his heart. Had he watched and prayed, do you think if Peter was there that night praying with Christ for that hour, do you think he would have had enough courage to then maybe even be crucified with Christ that maybe he would have avoided the denial? Don't you think that would have been awesome for Peter to say, I watched and prayed with Christ? Well, Peter wrote a couple of books himself. 
And I know Peter Mishriki and I have this contest of see who can include this verse in every single talk, and it's his one of his favorite verses. <laughs> okay, St. Peter writes this, be sober and be vigilant. In other words, be awake, be watchful, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You want to know why Peter wrote that? Because he was devoured. Because he was not watchful. St. Peter, after all those years, says, listen, be watchful. You want to know why? Because your enemy is watchful. He's watching you. He is more watchful than you are. So why should you not be watchful? He says, you will be devoured. The Great Wall of China was one of the greatest barriers for an enemy in the history of mankind. Until one night, the guard left the door open. The enemy saw the door open and they went in. China was not prepared for war because they had the wall. They were destroyed because one door of the wall that is hundreds of miles long. You have to watch always and you have to watch every door, every entry into your heart has to be guarded. In Ezekiel 34, he talks about, he talks to Ezekiel, God's telling Ezekiel, I'm going to make you a watchman. Do you know what a watchman was? In those days, they had the cities with the walls, they had the watchman, and they would be looking. They were looking for the enemies. And if there was an enemy coming, the watchman would sound and the people would be aware. And he said this to Ezekiel and he told the people. He says, if the watchman tells you to be aware and you don't, your sin is upon you and your destruction you deserve. But if the watchman tells you something and you respond, you will be saved. Then he tells the watchman himself, Ezekiel, woe to the watchman. If the watchman doesn't alert the people, I will not hold it on the people. I will tell and hold it on the watchman. Do you want to know today we're having an anointing ceremony? I have no authority for anything, but you are all watchmen. You are all today, you are watchmen, and you are your watchmen. You are now appointed a watchman of your heart. You have to hold this responsibility with the utmost diligence, because if the Great Wall of China could be penetrated because they didn't keep their eyes open for one night, what could happen to your heart? Are you watching and are you fighting? Are you watching your heart and are you seeing how you could be attacked? You have to be a guard for your heart. And I don't think we all, I mean, we probably do realize this, but you want to know how we're attacked the most? How are we attacked? How does Satan attack us the most? How does he get to our heart the easiest? You want to know through what? We have five ways through our senses. Through our senses, Satan has the entry to our heart. How many times have you not censored your eyes and you allowed Satan right in to your heart? How many times have you not censored your ears and your mind was filled with something that took you down? How many times have you tasted too much? How many times have we allowed him because we didn't guard our senses and we didn't guard our hearts? The devil's looking for an entrance and it oftentimes can be through the uncensored things that you, you do. So I'm almost done here. I got about a long time. So um, we're almost there. The process of sin. The fathers have studied the process of sin. They dedicated their whole lives on the sins of the mind. It says this. The mind will receive a suggestion or a stimulation. If the mind is attentive, if you're watchful, it will notice the provocation and will close the door on it. If you can stop it at that first step, you have a great chance of not going any further. You see that thing on Facebook? You scroll down. You see the thing on the web page? You scroll down. You see something on TV, you change the channel. You shut it off. You do whatever. But if you don't, the soul will then dialogue with the suggestion and give its assent to it. Meaning, okay, I'm willing to discuss it. 
it becomes sinful because it consents to the thought with pleasure. There's a union with the thought and the mind surrenders itself to the suggestion. You know, you didn't want to say something mean to someone. You're like, you know, I'm just not going to do Well, let me. All of a sudden you're like, I kind of want to. The mind is made captive by the thought. The mind is made captive by the thought. Your mind is a slave now. Your mind is a prisoner. And then you consent to it time and time again. And then finally you fall so completely under the power of the suggestion, you're no longer free to resist it. And if you have a repeated sin, because we've let ourselves get past step one. There's this great author, Tito Coliander. He wrote a book called The Way of the Ascetics. It's, it's a very highly ascetic book. But he has this quote, and I love it. He says, impulse knocks like a salesman at the door. Have you ever had this experience? If one lets him in, he begins his sales talk about his goods, and it's hard to get rid of him. Even if one observes that what he's selling is not even good, then you consent, and finally the purchase, often against your own will. Because you let the salesman in, all of a sudden, he's going to give you a really good pitch. And I am the biggest sucker at these pitches. I buy so many timeshares over and over. That's how it is with our spiritual lives too. The sin, if you entertain the thought for a moment, you know, you're probably not in the biggest sin right now, this moment, because you're not there. You're probably not thinking about it. But once you allow it to enter your mind, you could fall in just as quickly. You have to keep up the guard. You know the famous saying, curiosity killed the cat. Our curiosity, where you're open to more things entering into your mind and into your heart, that kills the cat. You need a watchman for your thoughts. Even in spiritual things, do you know if your thoughts are from God or not? Do you test your thoughts according to biblical principles? Is this what I desired or is this a temptation? We can do this when we pray. How many of you had a great prayer? You're like, man, you're, you're into it, you know, all the way up to 10 minutes. Like, man, this is a good prayer. I'm feeling warm. I'm feeling close to God. I, I am probably pretty holy. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm probably above most other people. You ever had those thoughts where you're praying and all of a sudden you have pride? Like, is that a thought from God? Is God telling me I'm really that good? Probably not. The Bible tells us to be a tester of the spirits. I've seen this happen with prayer. And I've seen it happen with the Bible. I've seen it happen with the Bible so many times where people get out of the Bible what they want to get out of it. I've heard people say, oh, God told me this. And I know they made their decision before the Bible was even open. They're looking for God to justify. Was that really from God? Was that from God or was it from another temptation? I've seen it happen so many times. You know the story of the monk where an angel came to him and said, Oh, you holy monk, the Father has accepted your prayers. And the monk says, Wait a minute, wait a minute. I think you have the wrong cell. Then the other monk who receives the angel comes and says, Oh, you are so highly favored and you're doing great, or whatever, and God has chosen you and he wants to show you grace and he's given you the authority to fly. He takes him up to the top of his cell. He says, Jump and God will catch you. And so he jumps and he falls hard. He falls really hard. I can't remember if it was severe injury or to his death. See, same message. One monk discerned, Is this really from God or not? They were both probably good monks, but they didn't discern. You need to be a watchman. Are the thoughts that I have from God? So, now I have the last part, and I did not pass this out, but... Here, can you... This is the practical part of what I wanted to talk about. Irma, can you just pass it back? So, what I want for you is to begin to practice watchfulness. 
And this is, I've narrowed it down to only seven points. Now, I didn't know that I was going to give this talk a couple months ago, but I bought a book on watchfulness a couple months ago. And I bought the book. When I got home, I looked at it to look at what the chapters are. It's like 25 chapters. There's no titles of the chapters. It's 25 chapters, just watchfulness. He just goes on. It's like 300 prayers of watchfulness. This is huge. It's a huge topic. I'm going to boil it down in like five minutes if, if I'm good. All right. So number one, you have to do daily examination. Daily examination. I want you to ask yourself, what did I do today? What are the things you did and why? Ask yourself, why am I angry? Why am I angry? Is it because I'm jealous? Is it because my ego was injured? Was it because I didn't get something that I want? Why am I sad? Is it because I didn't get what I want? Someone injured my ego? Why do I think bad about certain people? Why is there someone in my mind that I'm thinking bad about? Is it envy? Is it pride? Why did I fall into this sin? Examine if you fell into a sin that day, which is probably every day. Why? Was it the environment? Was it I was stressed? What were the thoughts that I was entertaining? Did I see the thoughts of evil? Why did I agree? Why am I avoiding God? Do you ever ask yourself at the end of the day, why did I avoid God? That's a good thing to examine yourself. Don't go weeks before you examine. Ask yourself that day, why did I not pay attention to God today? Is there a sin I don't want to let go of? Is there a sin that's taking hold of me that I'm full of shame and that's why I avoided him? There's a great monk. He said this thing. He says, since I've been in the desert, I've fallen into many sins, but never the same sin twice. Never the same sin twice. Meaning, Satan can try and trick me once, but then I evaluated and then I was aware. Are you at the end of the day examining that tomorrow is a better day? Tomorrow is a holy day. Tomorrow you will watch for the traps. You have to examine at the end of the day. Number two, the fathers talk about this all the time. Think about the final judgment and death daily. So as I was preparing this last night, I was thinking, well, what if I didn't have to give this talk tomorrow? What if I actually died last night? I would have stopped preparing early, but I was trusting that God would get me through the night. But I realized that if last night was my last night, there would have been a lot of regrets. There would have been sins that I hadn't repented of. If you were to think about your last day, think about your last day. If today was your last day, how would you spend it? You would be on your knees begging and praying God for mercy. You would say, God, I want to be right with you. What if that was every single day? God, on my knees, I want to be right with you. I know that you will judge us according to our deeds. I haven't been perfect. But they say, the Father say, if you have the judgment in front of your eyes every day, you should not sin. But we don't think about the judgment. We don't think it's a real thing. We don't think it's a close thing. We don't think it's going to happen to us. We don't think we're going to have a problem. Why? The Bible says you'll be judged according to your deeds. We pray, have mercy on us according, not according to our deeds, but according to your mercy. Because it says you'll be judged according to your deeds. Does that scare anyone? It should. Now, I don't want you to lose hope and salvation. God will save you. You are Christians, baptized, come to church, earnestly desiring Him. You don't have to be perfect. You won't be perfect. You will be sinners. But shouldn't that bring some type of change? That if I were to examine and think of His judgment, what if tomorrow morning you said, God, I repented last night. Today, I could be judged. I have one day. God, let me make it my best. I want to try to not do this sin. Number two. Sorry, number three. You know the three great giants of the devil are? The three great giants of the devil are forgetfulness, ignorance, and laziness. Forgetfulness, ignorance, and laziness. Just think, if you were more watchful and you weren't so forgetful about the mercies and forgiveness of God, the love of God. When How many of us love Good Friday? We love thinking about His cross. We're like, man, we have an amazing God. We forget God died on the cross 364 days of the year. Well, we've got three feasts, so 362. Why is it that we don't think about the cross? Why don't we think about the resurrection? Why don't we think about the time he helped us last time? Why do we forget 
all these things. Why do we forget his commandments? Because we're not watchful. What about ignorance? We're so ignorant about certain things. We don't know the ways to get to heaven. We don't know the ways to repent. We don't have the spiritual tools. That can hurt us. And then laziness. Enough said. You guys know about laziness, right? Number four, be watchful about those things. It's interesting when you examine laziness, what led to your laziness? Why do I accept laziness towards God and not towards work, towards my sports leagues, or towards the gym? For some reason, we expect we accept laziness towards God, but not in those other things. Why? Number four, set a guard over your senses. On your phones, on your TVs, on your radio, while you're talking to friends, set a guard. You can do that. It's all on everything. You can do it on your phone. You can set a tube for. You can set a setting for YouTube. You can set a Google search document uh, 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 limiting a filter. You can do it for your TV. You can have certain things blocked. You can choose to set things so that you protect your senses. If you're letting your senses open, you're opening yourself for attack. Number five, set your mind on God more than once a day. If you only think about God the time you pray in the morning or the time you pray at night, then you're missing out. What they talk about is watchfulness and prayer. They say, think about God, be in God's presence all day. And they say, do it through short prayers. We're going to talk about the Jesus prayer eventually, but that's the key one. My Lord Jesus Christ, my sweet Jesus, have mercy on me. My Lord Jesus Christ, help me. My Lord Jesus Christ, comfort me. My Lord Jesus Christ, give me, I'm afraid. My Lord Jesus, you talk to him, you block out the thoughts. One of the biggest things in, in our focus is controlling our minds. Our minds can be controlled. When you go into prayer and all those thoughts are coming in, your mind can be controlled through short prayers. You will block them out. We'll talk about that. Examine your thoughts and your intentions. Why is it you do the things that you do? What are the plans in your heart? Why is it that you're trying to get that next promotion? Is it because you want prestige? Is it because you want more money? Is it Why is it you're investing in stocks? Because I really want to be rich and I want to buy more stuff and I want all for me. Why is it that you're thinking bad about that person? Why is it that you are avoiding someone? You need to think about your thoughts and your intentions. And last one, be watchful during your spiritual exercises. In the liturgy, when the deacon says, you who are seated stand, it's not just because we're lazy and we need to stand. It's actually reminding us. It's be standing and be vigilant. We're reminded over and over by the deacon, come with your mind. Stand up for prayer. Be vigilant. We're reminded in the liturgy and in your prayer. And in your prayer, if you do not have the mind of focusing on God, your prayer will be gone in two minutes. In your prayer is when you have to be the most focused on words. That's why we have the spiritual books that we read. It's easier to focus on something you're reading than just coming up with not having anything and let your mind just go. Because when your mind just goes, everything comes in. But when you focus on something you're reading, you can block them out. You have to focus. The fathers say focus on words when you pray. Focus on words. Go and be watchful. I, like I said, there's volumes on this chapters. And I know I spoke too long, but I really felt like we need to begin somewhere. Being watchful is incredible. You have something in your hands. Go and try and practice this week. Let's stand up and pray. With complete attention. In the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. My Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone just say in your mind, my Lord Jesus Christ, my Lord Jesus Christ, my Lord Jesus Christ, my dear Lord Jesus Christ, the beautiful one, the one who loved us, the one who gave himself for us, the one who has called us to greater and greater intimacy and greater and greater relationship and greater and greater love and greater and greater potential and future to be pure and to be freed and to be filled with you, to become like you, to become who we always want to be but who we're afraid to be. I thank you, dear Lord, because you have given us the authority to trample on the serpents and the scorpions and every power of the enemy. You've given us all the graces we need. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to hold on to them and to use them, not because we want to just save ourselves, but because it's what you've desired for us as our Father. 
I pray, dear Lord, that you would work a great thing in every one of our hearts. I pray, dear Lord, that you would begin to purify us. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to put up a good fight to the very last breath. Help us, Lord, to desire the, the holy things, the inner fire. I pray that you would kindle that fire in each and every one of our hearts. I pray that we would be burning for you and for your kingdom and for your glory. We want to have more and more of you. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to let go. Help us to be cleansed. I pray, dear Lord, that you would remove things from us and help us, Lord, to follow in the path of righteousness, which you've shown us and you've given us the way and all the gifts to do. Dear Lord, so many of us are beaten down by sins right now, including myself. I pray, dear Lord, we cry unto you with mercy, asking for your mercy on us right now. We know that you're willing to answer us every moment. I pray, dear Lord, that you would reach out to us, hear every one of our prayers, embrace us, O oh Lord, help us to guard the gifts that we've been given, your holy body and your blood. Let us not just let it go, flee away, but let us preserve it, dear Lord. Let us be watchful. I pray, dear Lord, you would give us the spirit of watching over our own hearts. Let us guard the treasure that you have given us, the kingdom of God inside of us. Give us knowledge. Give us understanding. Help us to know ourselves. Help us to know you. Help us to know each other. Help us to love each other. Help us, O oh Lord, to find you in each other. Help us, O oh Lord, to be you to each other. The intercessions of St. Mary and all the saints who have followed this path and have pleased you from the beginning. Hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.